So it's my pleasure today, uh, ENST, thank you for coming to Carlton Poindexter's exit seminar. Um, he, during his time at UMD, Carlton has become a Global Stewards um, Fellow. That's an NSF supported program that um, I, I requires a lot of extra work. And um, I know that Carlton was very engaged in that program and actually published a paper that I don't think even appears in his dissertation. So that's a truly amazing feat. Um, also, while he was here, he, yeah, oh, sorry, I lost my place. Oh, well, now I see the rest of it. Okay, so originally Carlton's from St. Louis, Missouri. He earned a bachelor's of science in biology and a minor in cultural anthropology from Webster University. Um, before obtaining his master's of science in biotechnology from Texas Tech. And then he worked as a plant biologist at Monsanto. Um, and I found it really interesting when, I, when he took my class years ago about uh, his time at Monsanto and he served as a Missouri US Green Building Council intern. So um, in addition to being a part of the UMD Global Stewards, he has two honorable mentions for the Ford Fellowship Foundation, um, a selection for the Science Communication Fellowship, and he served as a Science Mentoring and Diversity Program Fellow, and recently was awarded a Wiley Fellowship. Outside of academics, Carlton advocates for environmental justice and civil rights. Um, he works closely with uh, numerous environmental justice organizations, and um, I just, he's a pretty amazing person to talk to. And so if I think most of you probably know him and have spoken with him, but if you haven't, um, you definitely should stay after or visit with him and um, get some more of these insights that he has, because it's, it's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, and do it quickly though, because he is defending very, very soon. Um, and with that, I'll let Carlton take it away. And just before Carlton takes it away, just a reminder that there's an evaluation form, a link to which is in the chat box. I'll send it out again uh, at the end, but uh, just be ready. Carlton. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lancy and Dr. Yarwood for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up today. I appreciate you attending my exit seminar. So today I'll be presenting on my dissertation research, which is titled Heated Movement, Thermal Treatment Mitigation of Biological Waste Antibiotic Resistance and Gene Mobility Through Waste Systems. Okay. And so briefly, this will be a recap of my dissertation research. And so we're gonna start off with a brief introduction, introducing what antimicrobial resistance is, how does it actually incur and why is it important? And then this is kind of outlining my numerous different chapters with the first chapter being a method that we developed. And then the latter three chapters being the assessment of different thermal-based manure and wastewater treatment technologies. And then my last chapter of my dissertation is a communications-based paper that hopefully is going to get published soon. That's basically looking at different elements of communications, uh, of, of storytelling in regards to using rhetoric, using metaphors, using future simulations, and how we can better disseminate information about antimicrobial resistance to the general public. But I know this kind of looks intimidating. I'm kind of surprised I did all this. And so for today's uh, lecture or seminar, I'm only going to focus, focus on the first two or the, the set, chapter two and chapter three. And so antimicrobial resistance. So that term in and of itself is an umbrella term for all antibacterial, antifungal, and antiparasitic uh, compounds that are used against microscopic organisms. And so the World Health Organization has declared AMR to be uh, one of the emerging global threats with certain agencies projecting by 2050 that antibiotic resistance will be one of the leading causes of human mortality. And so antibiotic resistance, which is what I, my research is specifically focused on, is also going to have huge impacts in regards to food and global health. And obviously, this impact is going to become, as antibiotics are, have been used and as bacteria become resistant to it, that's going to result in people having to stay in hospitals longer, which is going to increase medical costs, as well as obviously increasing death. And so this is not only an issue for humans, but this is also an issue for animals as well. And so for anyone who's not familiar with how antibiotic resistance actually occurs, antibiotics and antibiotic resistance are natural compounds and a natural phenomenon. 
Certain species of bacteria have been able to produce antibiotics as second, secondary metabolites, which they can use as a competitive advantage. And so they release these antibiotics that generate a selective pressure for other, for other bacteria to, that are susceptible to it. Some bacteria are innately resistant to it and they have genes and various mechanisms to avoid these antibiotics. And so when an antibiotic is administered, say to us to treat a, a specific disease or ailments, it's gonna enact that selective pressure, wiping out any, any bacteria susceptible to it that thus allows the, uh, the bacteria that produce the antibiotics and also re um, resistant antibiotics to fill that communal void. And that's what allows for the what's left over to be species that can obviously avoid resistance. And so in addition to those species that have that innate resistance, my, uh, bacteria and other microbes have uh, various mechanisms of changing genetic material known as horizontal gene transfer, which can happen via tra conjugation, transformation, or transduction. So how did the antibiotic resistance problem or how did antibiotic resistance become a problem? And so since its discovery in 1928 by Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin, it's been mass produced in, it started, penicillin started mass production in 1945. And so once we found that antibiotics are very effective at treating various types of diseases and ailments, of course, we're gonna go ahead and use it. And so hospitals obviously are high utilization, are places of high utilization to treat various types of diseases. And over time, we found different types of antibiotics, as well as the starting to develop synthetic antibiotics. And so in addition to hospitals, um, we obviously have man, um, antibiotic manufacturers, and then we have a less concentrated aspect, us, our neighborhoods where we reside as we take antibiotics, probably not regularly, but when we have various like, not as severe as we have to go to the hospital, but something as simple as an ear infection, right? A lot of times we get antibiotics for those for simple, simple um infections and things like that that we take at home. And it's been used extensively also within animal agriculture to treat obviously sick animals, but it was also uh, largely believed at a time to help with animal growth. And so it was used as a growth promoter. And so although antibiotics have been very effective at treating a wide range of diseases and ailments, our bodies, as well as animals' bodies, don't actually metabolize these compounds very well. And so a lot of times, majority of the compounds administered comes out either unmetabolized or still as biologically active metabolites. And that's what's going to come out in our waste via urine, but primarily through like our poop. And so while a lot of research has focused clinically on antibiotic resistance occurring in uh, you know, certain patients, within the human gut, as well as in hospitals, there's now been a growing body of research that's focused on what happens afterwards. Because even at the hospitals, as those patients are taking those antibiotics, they still have to go to the bathroom. They're still not metabolizing these things. And so it's getting out into the wastewater treatment system. And so that's why wastewater treatment systems, as well as animal manure, have been primary focuses of research as our waste is being the primary transport of not only antibiotics, but resistant bacteria, and as well as the resistant genes. And so for animal manure, that's what we end up applying as a fertilizer onto our fields. And so that's how that gets into the uh, ecosystem, as well as with the wastewater treatment plant, our treatment plants aren't really designed to treat antibiotic resistance. And so a lot of times antibiotics are flowing through you know, our, our waters, as well as um, the bacteria that are resistant and that's getting out also into the environment. And so now we're trying to understand how administration within these specific spaces and then the application of waste and waste being exposed to the environment is influencing antibiotic resistance and uh, increasing antibiotic resistance in the environment and what potential impacts that could have for humans later on. And so this chart or this graph right here was taken from the FDA's 2020 summary of antibiotics distributed and sold to the United States. And so this is going to outline all the different types of antibiotics used, potentially used for animal agriculture. Again, this is just saying what is sold is not necessarily saying that they're using all of this amount. But I'd like you to draw particular attention to medically important uh, drug classes. And so this is an important class to examine uh, solely on the, the guise of that medical importance means that these are antibiotics that are not only used for animals, but they're also used for human consumption as well. And so when we're talking about what's being administered and potentially parallel resistance, so as we're using a lot of say tetracyclines for cattle and they just and they their gut bacteria becomes resistant and they start to have these diseases. And again, as we're putting this in the environment, there could be a potential crossover of diseases and bacteria that affect 
cattle, swine, or chickens that could potentially have impacts on us later on. And so that's why there's been a lot of emphasis specifically on medically important drug classes. Now, very briefly, I would like, so I we could also focus on tetracycline and looking at, since it started, this is measuring um, antibiotics bought since 2011, you can see specifically for tetracycline, there has been a drop since around 2018 and after. And that's a general trend for most of the other antibiotics as well. And this is likely the result of the 2018 uh, veterinary feed directive that the United States administration recently put into place. That was basically saying that now we can't just give animals antibiotics as growth promoters. They have to be uh, administered with a, a authorization by a veterinarian to show that the animal is sick and that they actually need to use it. So now since then, we're actually starting our first regulation on actual antibiotic utilization and consumption in animal agriculture. And so with this, where does my research actually tie in? So my research ties in and looking at how these antibiotics are being used in animal agriculture and how there are, and if there are potential treatments or treatment technologies that we use to help mitigate it, as well as understanding how our genes are moving through the waste treatment systems. And so one of the first papers and projects that I worked on, which uh, recently got accepted to the Journal of Antibiotics literally on Friday. And so I'm very excited about that. But one of the first things we started with is quantifying antibiotic distribution in soil and liquid fractions of manure using the two-step multi-residual antibiotic extraction method. So this paper is basically talking about uh, LCMS extraction method that we developed to try to understand or try to normalize and enhance um, detection of antibiotics within manure. And so why is this paper so important? So manure, so obviously there are different types of manure and that can be varied based on the animal that's producing it as well as the age and diet. And so that makes manure a very kind of complicated substrate. And so with it being so complicated and being so varied, uh, extraction efficiencies can be uh, you know, highly variable and, and uh, dependent as well. And so this is also important in, this, in the sense of there's not much regulation about antibiotics or standardization of um, screening for antibiotics and uh, specifically in like environmental samples. And so we're trying to help with, uh, develop a method that can be used ubiquitously throughout manure as hopefully soil samples as well. And also there's not any known quantification of how much antibiotics is actually getting put into the fields. Obviously thinking about big farms, small farms, everybody's are using these things for the care of their animals, for the care of their businesses. And so we don't actually know how much is actually getting out in the field. And so we're hoping this method will help to get a better understanding of that as well. And then additionally, because manure can come in so many different forms, we want to understand how bioavailability is playing an impact. So as there's different types of manures, different types of manure substrates, the antibiotics will respond differently. And so in some cases, they may be enacting antibiotic selective pressures. In some cases, they may not. And so some manures might be more prone to degrading these antibiotics and some might not. And so there are different implications and ramifications of the antibiotics based on the manure substrates. And so again, the objective of this first paper is basically to develop or enhance a previously used LCMS method, also known as liquid, chrom or liquid chromatography in tandem with mass spec, also known as LCMS. And so when we were developing this method, we had a few principles that we wanted to keep in mind. Well, one of them being that we wanted this method to be multi-class, multi-residual. There are a variety of methods already produced, but they are say for one or two classes. And so we wanted to include a broad spectrum of classes so we can get more uh, a broader analysis. We also want to uh, focus on a class that has not really been uh, included because they're very hard to detect and that's beta-lactams. And so beta-lactams include uh, penicillin, cephalophorin, ampicillin, and this class is specifically challenging due to their structure. And so they have a beta-lactam ring that is easily hydrolyzed. And so it's, they're obviously degraded very quickly, but this, is, but this class has a lot of high utilization. And so we know that it's being used a lot, but we can't actually find these antibiotics in the actual substrates. And so we wanted to kind of focus on them and stabilize these nodes and trying to see if we can get high recoveries in that specific group. We also want to ensure that this method was practical for large samples analysis, understanding that sometimes you're processing you know, 10 samples, sometimes you're processing 100. So we wanna make it as efficient 
uh, as possible. And then the biggest component was we want to be uh, applicable, applicable to various manure substrates. And so as you can see on the pictures on the side, manure can come in various forms. We have the middle picture, which is like, you know, fresh raw manure, it's pretty solid straight out the cow. But then oftentimes in uh, housing unit or in barns and farms, the animals are inside. And so they poop, they are pooping and peeing, and then they flush it out with water. And so now we have more of an aqueous slurry mixture. And then there's also the times where we have like dried uh, samples that we see at the bottom. And so while this is all the same type of, this is all manure, right? And so up to date, these different substrates are being examined in very different ways, which I'll talk about very, uh, later on in the presentation. And so while we try to figure out how many antibiotics we want to include, this is the final list, the top part's a little cut off, but we were decided to include four beta-lactams, uh, sulfamides, tetracyclines, and macrolides. And again, we picked these because these are uh, medically important groups and they uh, have high utilization not only in the cattle and dairy industry, but also these are antibiotics that are used for human consumptions as well. And so where do we start? And so we did an extensive literature review going over previous methods, previous multi-class methods to see what's already been out there and trying to reproduce that in our own labs as well as finding ways so we could try to amplify or increase efficiencies of the recoveries. And again, going over all these different methods, there was a broad array of techniques and uh, procedures that are used. And so in some ways it was kind of fun trying to re reproduce all these kinds of things, but also kind of sucks because sometimes we weren't able to get accurate. Uh, uh, we weren't able to get similar results as the previously published paper. And some of them were just very cumbersome to kind of carry out and do. And so again, all these were done with HPLC and the mass spec. Um, and very briefly, for those who aren't familiar with uh, liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry, they're both powerful analytical chemistry techniques with the HPLC being uh, liquid chromatography where you're gonna separate the samples and then we're gonna use our mass spectrometer to actually analyze and identify those samples, uh, the analytes within the samples. And so here is just, again, kind of, it's kind of cut off the top, but here is just like an example of one of the many extraction protocols that we tried. In this case, we use an accelerated solvent extraction, which is basically you kind of pack sand into a column and then we have a machine that's going to put a lot of pressurized through it and that's supposed to help clean out all the unwanted material that we don't want to include in the matrix and it's supposed to catch all that kind of stuff. We are freeze drying our manure, we're blending it up so that we can, um, have, we're trying to help homogenize the sample and break it down by blending it. And again, this is just various apparatuses that we tried. And so we tried a wide range of Solvents that we use with buried methods, we tried salting. We've also looked into using various types of chemicals such as heptane for uh, lipid removal. Um, when we did work to stabilize, to try to stabilize some of the beta-lactams, there was a previous paper published that used this chemical known as piperidine. And while that was kind of effective, it was also very hazardous. And so we decided to stay away from that. And so after going through all of these different trials and tribulations and vetting of previous methods, we did find to have some success with two specific, uh, with a liquid-liquid extraction using EDTA, maclovain, and methanol. And so with that, this is a general extraction procedure that we were able to come up with using 10 milliliters of EDTA maclovain as well as 10 milliliters of methanol and applying that stepwise. And again, just going through sonication vortexing and centrifugation, and then cleaning it up with an SPE solid phase extraction column. And then these are some of the LCMS conditions as well. And so once we had that kind of understanding that this is kind of, this, this process is kind of working, we wanted to build on that. And so one of the things that we wanted to build and honestly try to help contribute to the field is trying to find a way to normalize um, trying to find a way to normalize the antibiotic concentrations and how much samples we're using. Because again, to date, me various methods have already been previously published, but they're looking at dramatically different manure substrates. So say even within the field of cattle manure, dairy manure, some people are looking at the raw manure, some people are looking at the composted manure, and some people are looking at 
the uh, liquid slurry. And so when they were doing their extractions, they were using various amounts. And so two grams of the manure slurry is gonna be very different than two grams of raw manure or the composted solids. And so when we're trying to compare antibiotic concentrations or trying to see how this is, or you know, concentrations that are getting put out in the field or if, they, or if the technologies are effective, everybody's using it from a different you know, sample amount. And so what we try to do is come up with a technique that we use very often in our own lab and basing it on the total solids. And so once we took the total solids of the samples, we were going to try to normalize that and base that on how much we were going to mass out for each sample. And so obviously the more solids that was in there, the less sample that we actually used for the mass extraction. And so again, this is a way to try to, this is the first attempt at trying to normalize those antibiotics, normalize the data across various types of manure substrates. And so once we did that, well, again, this is applying the ETA McIlvain and the methanol, and these fractions were, uh, they were analyzed separately, but then we combined them together for total recoveries, and which we can see in this next slide. And so these are the various um, antibiotics that we were able to discuss, or uh, were able to um, use in this particular study. And then these are the different fractions that we're seeing um, with the uh, unprocessed manure, the solid liquids fractions of the ETA, the solids, the solids separated EETA and the brew EETA. And there's also, it's kind of cut off, but there's also the methanol fraction. So each column has both the methanol and the EETA fractions included in those to in the total values that we see. And so one of the biggest things that we want to highlight is, again, as we're trying to use this method to normalize uh, antibiotic extraction, the recoveries across the different manure substrates. So again, we're using raw manure, a liquid separated manure, a solid separated manure, and then a final process composted manure. And so again, these four different types of substrates, we're getting kind of uniform recoveries over across the four different substrates. So that's kind of very, that was actually very positive. And that shows that this normalization technique or process is actually applicable. So we were very happy and excited about that. And so once we got this kind of figured out, based on the total solids, one of the last experiments that we included in this paper is trying to figure out, all right, we have this method, the total solids is working. So now we're trying to figure out how we can optimize the final method. Because at this point we had been analyzing the ETA and the, uh, the ETA McIlvain buffer so solvents and the methanol solvent separately. And so we're saying that kind of doubles the sample amount. So how can we combine them together and, uh, only for only one injection instead of doing two separate analyses. And so this was different uh, ways we tried to do it. So again, they were applied stepwise on one sample. So the EDTA was applied first, um, and then the methanol is applied. EDTA is applied, taken off. The methanol is applied, taken off. And then method A, they're combined together and then diluted, S, uh, cleaned up through SPE, and then uh, dried down and filtered. Whereas with method B, we still did stepwise. EDTA pulled off, and then methanol pulled off. But then we only SPE the EDTA fraction, and then we combined it after the methanol was blown down, just to see how these different combinations would work. And so what we see here are the results of the different methods. So we have method A over here, which you can see was largely more successful, was high, had higher success rate uh, compared to method B. And so the median line that we can see, Right here has a overall, we were able to, to recover overall across all antibiotic classes, around 56 to 60% of those antibiotics. We had over 100% recoveries of tetracycline, which is great. And one of the big things that we really are wanted to highlight is the fact that if you pay attention to the triangle here, is that we were actually able to get pretty good recoveries of penicillin. That's one of our beta-lactams. While the other beta-lactams, you can see down here, we weren't able to, we weren't too successful with. And again, they've been a challenging group. A lot of people have just kind of left them out of analysis, but it is promising that we're at least able to get high extractions of penicillin. And so with that, we decided the method A would be the method, is the, um, the most promising method, and that's kind of the method that we're encouraging in this paper to be used potentially in the field. And so finally, some just major conclusions is that we were successfully able to develop a single, a single method for multi-residual analysis and multiple manure substrates. Um, 
something I didn't really talk about in this particular presentation, but it's talked about since leaving the paper is how the antibiotics are actually interacting with the actually interacting with the various um, solvents that we're using as some antibiotics were, were more successfully extracted with the EDTA versus the methanol and how that's related to the antibiotics uh, structures and their property, physiochemical properties. And again, method A was selected as the best uniform method that we were able to come up with with these recoveries for the various manure, uh, various antibiotics. And then finally, again, the consistent recovery of penicillin G had not been reported uh, previously. And so we're happy to report that we're actually able to get that across manure substrates. And so in addition to just trying to develop this method, it was very important because it segues into the next experiment that we did, which I kind of apologize. This name is very long. I have struggled so hard to try to get the best name for it. And so um, it's called a mass balance approach to antibiotic resistance partitioning in dairy manure through a continuous high temperature rotary drum composting embedding recovery unit. From this point on, we're just going to reference it as the brew study. And so this study is what we're going to look at. And this particular instrument or this um, machine that's used at one of our collaborating farms actually produces four different substrates from manure. And so this is a prime example of how we can use and apply our now published methods to seeing how the antibiotics and resistant genes and bacteria are actually partitioning based on the separation and different types of manure substrates that are being produced. And so a bedding recovery unit is basically an in-house unit that can be used to help uh, produce bedding material. And bedding material is what they put inside for barns for animals to rest on and also helps with like preventing heat, heat loss. And it can also be helped to use and absorb, you know, all the pee and things like that that get in the barn. And so I'm pretty sure people aren't aware, but there's been a, a rise in the cost of quality uh, bedding material. And so a lot of farmers are trying to find ways to produce bedding uh, material in home so they don't have to find, so they don't have to pay so much and reduce costs. And with this uh, specific unit, you know, it helps to separate and dry and disinfect undigested fibers of the slurry that again, they can use as that bedding material. And also in some cases they could use it to apply it onto fields. And so this specific unit or this specific technology is very efficient in that it's economical because they can have in-house and don't have to spend money to buy it elsewhere. And it's environmentally compatible because they're using their own cow or animal livestock manure to produce the bedding material. And so one part of that that's extremely important that, prevent, that produces these various manure substrates is that it has a screw press separator. And so the screw press separator is what we're gonna go to in the next slide. And this is what's generating that various manure, uh, different types of substrates. And so once that raw manure is taken that we saw in that uh, first picture outlining this specific experiment, it goes from that, uh, you know, that liquid stuff, that liquid uh, manure full of all the water and all those kind of things. And now it's going to turn it into, again, just squeezing out all that water and leaving just the leftover solid materials, the fibers, the straws and, uh, and various undigested pieces of the manure. And so this has been a key technology for like manure and wastewater treatment as it separates and dewaters the manure that allows for a better uh, treatment of not only the solid separated fraction, but also the liquid separated fraction. And so this um, solid liquid separation has been gaining traction within the dairy industry as more and more farms have been trying to use technologies to help produce, uh, to help with extract, or not extracting, uh, to help treating their manure. And so the screw press, as there's various types of technologies for solid liquid separation, the screw press is specifically known to help remove a lot, extensive amounts of water and help to make like this cake-like material that can then be composted. And so the objectives of this particular study was to quantify the partitioning of antibiotics, ARGs, which are resistant bacteria, AR, resistant genes, ARBs, which are resistant bacteria, between the solid separated and solid liquid separations but are using the mass balance approach and then how substrate characteristics will influence all these things, as well as measuring the impact of the high temperature rotary drum composting, which is at the tail end of this system. And so here's a schematic of the system that we use. And so this experiment was done with collaborators at Cornell uh, in upstate New York. And so what we have here is a continuously run uh, screw press in tandem with a high temperature rotary drum. And so what happens is the manure is going to be emptied out into the influent pit, which was around 100,000 liters. 
And then it's going to be immediately pumped and pumped into the solid liquid screw press separator. The liquid fraction is then going to be pumped into an adjacent uh, effluent pit that was around 80,000 liters. And then once that fills up, they just uh, siphon that off into a storage lagoon, whereas the solid separated fraction is then going to fall. The solid separated fraction is then going to fall into like this 40 foot rotary high temperature rotary drum composter. And so with that, the rotary drum composter is held at around 72 degrees Celsius. And, and it's going to just process through that the whole time and then finally come out as this treated brew material. And so because it's continuous, this is a continuous uh, system, we decided to sample over 24 hours of collecting samples from the, uh, from the influent manure all the way to the treated samples. And so four different substrates were generated, the untreated raw manure, the separated, the solid separated liquids, the solid separated solids, and then that final treated brew product. So while developing the mass flow monitoring, so our collaborator, which you can kind of see, Christine, she's in the red. We had to figure out how we're going to try to track our manure in the system because we decided to use hospital bar manure because those are the uh, those that would be the manure that would have the highest concentration of antibiotics that we'd be able to detect. And so what we did, we had them take two truckloads of that hospital bar hospital bar manure, pump it into uh, pump it into the pit, and then we tried to track that going through the system. And so how are we going to track that? And so before we came to New York, Christine did a tracer study using corn kernels to see how long the manure is actually going to have residency, not only in the pits, but also how long it's going to have residency in that rotary drum composter. And so with that in mind, we actually found that once the solid separate material enters the rotary drum, it's going to be in there from around 13 hours after it was initially taken up to 26 hours. And so that's over a, a day's time of sampling. And so what we did was in the first two hours, we took uh, sequential samples of the raw, solid separated and liquid separated manure in 30 minute intervals. We wanted to do it for a, little, a lot longer, but the barn was kind of backed up. And so they had to add in the non-hospital barn manure, which would dilute everything. So that's why we had to cut off analysis at that point for those particular samples. And then what we did was we came back after uh, 13 hours that we started the experiment to start collecting samples by looking for when the corn kernels were coming up, that would be uh, that would be indicators for the sample that was immediately taken up with the, with the hospital barn samples. And so we did that from 13 hours after initial addition of manure to hour 26. And so over that time process, we collected over 177 measurements of the manure, trying uh, weighing manure and um, uh, weighing the manure to help to calculate mass balance, as well as calculating how quickly the pit was being emptied so we can develop a mass balance. So here are some of the first results. So when we screened for all the 13 antibiotics that we had in our developed method, we were able to find three parent compounds. And so we were able to find tetracycline, uh, telathromycin, and penicillin G. Penicillin G, yeah, penicillin G. And of those three, we were happy because those were reported by the farmers to be antibiotics that were fairly recently administered. And so we were able to recover those. And so in addition to the tetracycline and penicillin G, we also decided to add some of their metabolites. And so we added four epitetracycline as well as benzyl, benzyl penicillic acid as metabolites because oftentimes the metabolite can be even more potent in terms of antibiotic um, selectivity than the parent compound. And so we wanted to try to monitor that as well. And so these are the concentrations we were able to find in micrograms per kilograms. And so using these concentrations with our mass measurements, we were able to calculate the total mass manure flow rate. And so as you can see in this column over here, the total flow rate per kilogram per hour was 7,730 kilograms per hour of manure. And so from there, once it fed into the solid liquid separator, we're finding that majority of the mass, about 95% of that mass is actually going with the solid separated or the solid liquid the separated liquid fraction and not the solid separated fraction. So only 5% is actually going on to the rotary drum composter that's then going to be um, composted and essentially treated. And so one thing I want you all to pay attention to is for the beta lactams, penicillin G and benzyl penicillin acid, they are not found in the solid separated samples because oftentimes the literature has reported that they tend to partition with more aqueous fractions. And so we can see that with these samples. 
whereas tetracycline and flapamycin, which is a macrolide, are known to bind and chelate to solid uh, particles and things like that, which is why we see them being carried on with the solid separated material. There is a slight increase with the brew effluent, so the final brew products in comparison to the separated solids, and that's not a result that more um, antibiotics are being produced. That's likely the result of a detection efficiency. So the solid separated sample hasn't been treated yet. And so there's a lot more things that can inhibit detection and analysis, whereas the final brew effluent has already been extensively treated. That removes water and uh, enacts degradation with the 72 degree rotary drum composting. So that allows for a greater efficiency uh, in terms of antibiotic analysis. So in addition to the antibiotics, we also wanted to try to quantify uh, resistant bacteria. And so we used two fecal indicator bacteria, uh, the gram-negative E. coli, as well as the gram-positive enteric oxide. And so when we did the bacterial counts, we did a slightly different approach than most other papers as they tend to use a MIC value, which is the minimal inhibitory concentration of the antibiotic. Whereas with this specific um, project, I wanted to see how this will work with actually reported uh, antibiotic concentrations. And so for ampicillin, it was 0.5 milligrams per liter. And for oxytetracycline, it was five milligrams or five milligrams per liter. And so oxytetracycline with it being uh, is more heavily used and it's able to bind in, uh, bind onto soda particles. So oftentimes it's reported to have higher concentrations, whereas ampicillin is one of the beta lactams. And so it's oftentimes you know, easily uh, degraded. So that's why that the difference between those are, uh, there's a difference between those concentrations because the ampicillin in the field is actually a lot lower because they're degraded a lot quicker. Um, and so one of the big things to focus on with both bacteria is that, again, the highest bacterial counts were coming from the raw manure as anticipated, and then followed, even though there's a significant reduction between the raw manure and the liquid separated and the solid separated. But one of the important things to highlight is the fact that in both e for both E. coli and enteric oxide, the final brew product, we reported no recovery. So there was no bacterial recoveries on any of those plates showing that the system was actually pretty effective at removing those pathogens. In addition to the Bacterial counts and antibiotics, we also screen for genes. Unfortunately, I, I just got the gene analysis kind of completed and analyzed. I wasn't able to get it into the paper in time or into this presentation in time, but that's a very important part of talking about the various resistant genes and how they're also partitioning within the substrates. And then one of the other things that I decided to include in this particular study is to monitor for metals. And so one thing, one significance metals has with antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance is that they have high positive correlation. So oftentimes heavy metals such as copper and zinc are toxic to bacteria. And so a lot of the mechanisms that bacteria use to um, evade or to um, try to evade these high concentrations of metals can be used to evade antibiotics as well. And so there's a, a terminology within the field of cross and co-resistance. And so I wanted to see if there were any metals and we were actually able to find metals, specifically copper and zinc, and, while, and tracking their mass flow. And we're hoping and the idea is that with this data, we're gonna see how, if this had any impact on the types of where the um, antibiotic resistant genes were kind of partitioning, or if there's any uptick or decrease of the antibiotic resistant genes or antibiotic resistant bacteria based on the metals that were present in those substrates. And so final conclusions from this particular study is that antibiotics, these are chemical properties, obviously influences substrate partitioning and concentration. The final th thermophilic rotary drum composting doesn't really have much impact on actual antibiotic degradation, but it was effective at eliminating the resistant bacteria. And that again, majority of the mass is actually partitioning with the solid liquid separated fraction, and that's going untreated into a storage lagoon, which can then be later applied to the field as fertilizer. And so that can give us, uh, you know, as assessing a specific unit, as, uh, assessing this technology, it's not seeming to be the most effective. And obviously, these farmers should find ways to treat their storage lagoon before they're applying it to the field. And with that, I have various other studies, but that's gonna be the inclusion of what we have discussed, what I'm gonna discuss today. And so with that, I just wanna give a special acknowledgement to all of my lab mates, my friends, my family, um, my committee members who all have been helpful in this uh, process and helping out carry out these various experiments, as well as all of my uh, collaborators and funders. And with that, any questions? Great, so we'll take questions from folks present.
here as well as online, but I'm going to take the prerogative of the first question. Yes. Um, so in your, when you were developing the methodology, you know, your experimental, you know, so the method you're going to use for your other experiment, mm -hmm. and you may have said this and I just missed it, but when you talk about recovery, Mm -hmm. So did you inoculate each of these samples with a known amount of these uh, compounds that then you sort of saw how did those, how much we could get, sort of get back out? Or did you somehow know what was in there in some other way? Yeah, so for the methods paper, we tried to get blank manure. So we tried to get people who are, get manure from places that haven't used a lot of antibiotics, so essentially as blank as it can be. And so from that point, we actually spike it with a known concentration and we'll determine recoveries based on that. And so with recoveries that were over 100%, that was, we recovered everything that we spiked in plus what was ever in the manure just before we even spiked in things of that nature. So that's how we got those recoveries for the method. Um, for the actual um, brew study, we didn't, uh, we spiked just to help with uh, developing the uh, standards, but we were actually just analyzing what was in the antibiotics by themselves. And so that's why those concentrations were a lot lower compared to what we were finding in our uh, method paper. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. My question is uh, related to uh, Dr. Raven his question mm -hmm. too, and that is, you were talking about different percent sort of recovery mm -hmm. for each antibiotic, and that ran into my mind that uh, sometimes, I mean, did you know what the total available of each antibiotic is in there, and whether that availability is, was the same, meaning in every different mixture right. that you have, uh, if it is not you know, because as you know, a total amount could affect how much it is being absorbed or right. going through other processes. And but even though you, you're reporting in percent, it's understand, but it's still the total amount could affect, you know, percent that we can extract. I was just wondering. About right. So in the methods paper, because we were focused on standardization, obviously we were spiking the amount and we, and just the substrates by themselves could lead to some of the antibiotics degrading quicker and things like that. And so with that method, it was just, again, based on how much we were able to spike and then recover from that. With that question in mind, what we saw in the brew with that study, that's what we're talking about with the different physiochemical properties of those uh, antibiotics. Because like the beta-lactams didn't actually fractionate with the solid separated material, whereas the tetracyclines, which are known to, again, absorb the material, does. And so that's something that a lot of research hasn't really gone extensively into, but it's definitely something that what, one of the things I'm telling, I think the research should go to specifically in the and the analytical field is looking at antibiotics, as you're saying, in their totality as well as bioavailability. And so, even with this particular study, once that bedding material is either you know taken into the barn or sometimes it's applied to the field, I think a good step is looking at what happens to what happens to those antibiotics then, not just antibiotic concentration, but what you know state they're in and if they're actually enacting any type of selective pressures. Well, there's an amazing study that was just trying to follow up, mm -hmm. and that is, it's not really a question, but a rather comment, and that is the gene, you know, sort of strand uh, research that you're doing, you have done, and mm -hmm. have time to present, relating that possibly to the degradation yes. states and stuff, that could really be interesting, uh, interesting paper. Yeah, that's what we're hoping to see. I've already just offered preliminary after preliminary analysis, I've already seen some very interesting things. Certain genes carried on to the solid separated at higher constant or gene copy numbers than compared to others. And then, so that's kind of what we'll be interested to see because I can give an indicator not only genes moving, but which types of bacteria are going where. And then also with the metals, seeing how that can actually occur. So yeah, there will be some um, analysis to seeing how these various influences are coming together. Yeah. Yes. So in your review of the literature, is there any indications of like what the best practices are on farms to reduce the prevalence of antibiotic resistance or is this completely like unexplored territory? So the best practice, so that's kind of tough. So it, it comes from both ends. So obviously treating the manure is very effective. Temperature has been a key element in how to treat them just because that degrades antibiotics as well as it removes a lot of the bacteria, but it doesn't remove everything. And some of my other studies looking at thermophilic digestion and high other different high temperature technologies, we see that yes, it dramatically reduces it, but it doesn't completely eliminate it. But one of the other ends, and one of the things that they're trying to promote, the CDC as well as the World Health Organization is again, like this one health model. And that part of that, one of the things we can do is be more judicious of how we're using antibiotics. 
And so a lot of this is just that beforehand, before 2018, antibiotics were used in growth promoters, in the feed and everything. So animals were constantly taking it and ingesting it, which allowed for a lot of mouse to be put out into the field. And so hopefully moving forward, understanding what we know now, we can be more, um, just be more responsible of how we're using it. And I also can go back into farmer management and if they can find ways to, you know, care for the animals that don't allow them to get, you know, very sick or if one does get sick, they can screen them early so you can pull them out from the others so the whole herd doesn't get sick and different like management practices like that. Yes. So I might have missed it in the, it's through, right? The, yeah. Okay. So it wasn't in that chamber aspect that's where it's getting heated or like? Or yeah. So it's getting heated. In the drum? Yeah, in the rotary drum. Okay. So it's only that that gets heated the rest of them are just like the separated liquid is yeah that's and that and that's part of the issue because so much of the mass and probably a lot of the antibiotic or we see a lot of the antibiotics as well as probably a lot of the genes are going in that solid liquid separated fraction that's just getting pumped to a storage system and going untreated and nothing's really in, in those lagoons and whatnot yeah there's not much treatment in there just outside of time <laughs> Yes. So, again, from the literature, uh, and I don't know whether you sort of come across this much, but, you know, we, we often think of the soil itself and the microbial populations in the soil as being sort of a treatment mechanism, mm -hmm. that, you know, sort of that competing with, uh, you know, uh, problematic bacteria pathogens and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, is there any, did you come across and have any perspective on kind of whether you know it's applied to agricultural fields, to what degree does the soil itself assist in this uh, treatment process? Right. Um, so there's been. I have to ask that as a soil. Yeah. There's there's various there's various studies. There hasn't been too many of like I guess like studying the legacy impact of like antibiotic applicate of antibiotic uh, applications. Um, so Lisa Durso, she's at the USDA NRS in Nebraska. She's actually doing a study now looking at just how um, the gene abundance has changed or no, she already published it. She published it um, comparing like an adjacent on a, you know, non uh, disturbed soil compared to a soil that's had uh, farmed and potentially had antibiotic added to it. And what was actually interesting was that the soil that was undisturbed had higher microbial or higher gene abundance than the disturbed soil. But that could just mean that there's just more microbial bacteria in there. And so part of the issue with that kind of question is trying to determine what part is being changed by applying fertilizer and the antibiotics and resistant bacteria versus what the soil actually was prior. And so that's a very tricky question. And a lot, few people have done like legacy studies like that. There's one been done in, um, what was it? I believe it was like uh, the Netherlands. And they saw that over time, there's just been a total increase in the, at least the resistant genes. They didn't do it. They didn't do an extensive study into the types of bacteria, but they are definitely seeing increases in the resistant genes in those soils. Uh, yes. Like maybe in two parts. Um, like, is there evidence that creating these antibiotics with heat? Um, and maybe pressure would degrade them? And if so, um, why do you think that, that it happened in this pit? So, Yes, temperature, a lot of different studies have found temperature to be very effective. And so again, we kind of looked at this particular instrument because of the high temperature rotary drum, which is supposed to be a 72C. Um, and then some of my other studies are looking at thermophilic digestion, which is at 55C. And these are all essentially supposed to be effective at, again, degrading the antibiotics and as well as being more selective in the microbial communities. And so it has been a very effective technique. It doesn't remove everything. And even when we talk about the removal of certain bacteria, there are going to be thermophilic bacteria that will have these same resistant genes. And so there will just, you know, fill the void and that type of resistance will um, occur. And honestly, one of one of the things I really want to look at or um, what is able to include in my dissertation is really looking at how these genes are moving specifically with digesters because there's a lot of different bacteria and bacterial communities in that space that um, even though the ones that we screen for like typically pathogenic bacteria might be removed if the 
you know, non-pathogenic bacteria is harboring the resistance, they can still facilitate various forms of uh, horizontal gene transfer. To answer your second question about why this wasn't effective in this particular treatment, that, um, you know, this could potentially be a result of a few different things. And so in terms of the genes, the genes might not, again, it might be that the bacteria just might be able to survive in that space. Um, in regards to the antibiotics, generally tetracyclines and macrolides have shown to be susceptible to heat, but there could be something in this particular case that maybe the rotary drum wasn't, even though I said it's 72C, maybe it needs to be in there longer. Uh, maybe it wasn't exactly at that temperature. And what was interesting and even trying to, as I'm writing this paper, is because the rotary drum does it so quickly. So this is happening within like 20, within, under 24 hours, right? And compared to most composting studies, which take weeks or days. And so this is an interesting unit in saying that generally, you know, it's large periods of time with antibiotics having various half-lives. It takes, and so sometimes there's studies that it takes you know, four months for all the antibiotics to be reduced. And we're trying, in this specific case, they're trying to say that they're, we're trying to see if it happens in a couple hours. And to the credit of the manufacturers of this specific unit, they're not, you know, touting that this is effective for antibiotic resistance. And it's just us trying to see if this would actually be effective as they're talking about this high temperature. And we're trying to see if it'd be a useful technology or not. Well, thank you again. And one more yeah. 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 uh, This is a, a little comment to see what your thoughts are on this. Okay. I think you might be, this might be complete BS. But, uh, <laughs> I had a group of Gemstone students work on antibi antibiotic resistance uh, several years ago. And they sampled constructive wetlands across the state to see what the antibiotic resistance was. And we looked at about the six similar antibiotics that you looked at. And what we found for, if I remember correctly, tetracycline was that when you looked at the carbon nitrogen ratio in the wetland soil, mm -hmm. where you had more nitrogen, you had less antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. And our thought was basically your nitrogen being the fuel for the metabolism of the microbes was basically giving them an advantage to kind of outcompete the ones that were resistant. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you had any kind of thoughts or maybe you ran across something related to that. <laughs> I mean, that definitely could be a phenomenon with just them having that source they could uh, function more. Another thing would be, and again, I kind of touched on it with one of the previous questions, is that when we're finding these antibiotics in the field, right now we're just reporting that they're there. What's the important next step is, again, the bioavailability, because we can find tetracyclines there, but if they're absorbed to the material in there and they're not enacting a selective pressure, then it's just another like carbon, essentially like just like a carbon source or just a compound in the soil. And so resistance isn't, you know, happening. And that's one of the studies that makes it a little bit harder because then we have to kind of look at the stoichiometry, the structures, uh, the orientations of the antibiotics and seeing how that has a play on toxicity. Okay. So based on our previous studies on pesticides and nutrients and soils, mm -hmm. the cycles that go through and the role of bacteria in post nitrification, mm -hmm. denitrification, many other processes and degradation of pesticides, toxics, generally organic matter, uh, temperature, mm -hmm. uh, these are these are things that activate the bacteria, they part. Right. In other words, more organic matter is more fluid, so they are more active in the soil if it's a soil-based you know, bacteria or manure crop. Mm -hmm. Another aspect is the volatilization. Certain chemicals volatilize right. under different temperature. Mm -hmm. So these antibiotics probably are not immune from volatilization. Right. But as you mentioned, probably the time that you're exposing the rotary drum and the temperature 72 is not really right. short time and also not very high temperature to have that much polarization. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just wanted to make that correlation that we deal with these with other chemicals in the soil and so forth as well. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Well, I think we all agree it's a very engaging and important topic that Carl uh, has been working on. And so let's give him another thank you. Thank you.